for revival, for the presence of God, is learning how to be a people that we dwell in intimacy with God 24-7, 365. Like I was saying earlier, we love revival meetings. We love getting rowdy. Ben's here. You know, we love, you know, worship leaders coming in. Oh, all right, that's great. But if it doesn't lead to a burning heart in the prayer closet, I'm wasting my time. I could just go do this somewhere else. Like, you're wasting your time if messages from me or someone else is just getting you excited but not making you want to get to the prayer closet after service. Amen? Yeah. You all got to talk to me now. Yeah. Come on. Let's be a little Pentecostal. Um, so, uh, one of my favorite stories that uh, I, I just love, I believe it's one of the most important things. It's funny, I was talking to John, he asked me my thoughts on IHOP, Kansas City, if we were into that. And, um, I won't get into that whole thing, but uh, IHOP, Kansas City, as a, as a major uh, foundational touch to my life. I, when I first became a Christian after being an atheist, uh, I started watching uh, International House of Prayer, you know, not the Pancake Place, International House of Prayer, <laughs> uh, Kansas City. I started watching their prophetic history videos, and they had this, uh, I think back then it was an eight-part series. They, you know, done a couple updated ones, but back then I think it was eight parts. And uh, one of the messages, um, Mike Bickle, who's the founding leader there, founding pastor or whatever, um, is talking about how God downloaded to them this message of the bridegroom out of the book of Song of Solomon. And it, it, if you don't know those messages, he talks about all these dramatic God experiences, angels appearing to people, and uh, heavenly experiences, and just amazing prophetic things that happen. And I remember being 17 years old and watching those and just going, I would just weep on my floor and say, God, I want to encounter you this way. I want to experience you this way. Is that what your heart's burning for tonight? Come on, you're, it is, you're in the right place. And I would pray that, and I remember one of the messages, I think it was maybe part five or six. Um, I remember as a kid uh, hearing about the book of Song of Solomon. Every, you know, Baptist kid thinks it's like the funniest book in the whole Bible because, you know, you just make weird jerks, jokes about it when you're a 13-year-old boy. <laughs> and um, so, you know, I was like, man, why is that one in the Bible? Why is that doing in there for, you know? And I see this message from Mike Bickle, and it's like encountering the love of God in the book of Song of Solomon. I'm like, man, this place is weird. What is this? And I'm watching this message, and the story goes that it was uh, 1985 or 6, somewhere around there. Mike Bickle was the pastor there. He grew up a boxer, grew up very emotionless. Uh, never really heard this concept of Jesus being the bridegroom. We're sons of God. He's a judge, he's a king, he's righteous, he's holy, but he's a bridegroom? That was kind of a foreign concept to him, and he's sitting in his office, and he gets a wedding card, uh, like an like a invitation or a thank you or something like that, and the front of the card has Song of Solomon 8.6, set your seal upon my heart, for love is as strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. As many flashes of, the, of love are uh, as the very flashes of the flame of Yahweh. He reads this verse. He never really read it before, he said. And he just starts weeping in his office. He just just violently starts weeping, going, oh, you know, just... And he wasn't like that. He was, like, kind of more of a Presbyterian at the time, okay? <laughs> and he starts just, like, loudly weeping and crying and encountering the heart of God. And it would kind of live... And then he would like look at the verse again on the card. Oh, Jesus, you love. He just this encounter started happening. And this was, again, very foreign to him. He wasn't a charismatic -y kind of person at the time. And the late great prophet Bob Jones calls him on the phone. He's in his office and he answers the phone. And Bob goes, hey. and you know, Bob Jones, goes, you know what I'm talking about? He's like, hey. You are reading Psalm of Solomon 8 6 right now. That's going to be your life message. God is. Returning the church back to his emotions. Ah, I gotta go. Got a plane catch. Hangs up, right? <laughs> and so I just I read that message or listened to that, and ever since then, one of my absolute favorite books, if not my favorite, is the book of Song of Solomon. We're gonna be a people that burn in the secret place, that go after God in the secret place. We need to be sustained on the emotions of God. Prayer gets boring. Prayer gets lifeless, prayer gets dry, when we disconnect ourselves from the emotions of God, okay? When we connect our hearts in truth by the word of God to the emotions of God, 
of how he feels about my little weak prayer life, my little weak attempts to make contact with God, when I connect that to how he actually feels about me, ten minutes of prayer turns into two hours of prayer. <laughs> two hours of prayer turns into four hours of prayer. We can become a people that we live in this place of prayer. And so I want to take you on a journey tonight. In the book of Psalm Solomon, I, I could do weeks and weeks and weeks on this, but I just want to give you some interpretative things and um, all that. So let's, let's put your finger in your Bible at Song of Solomon, but let's uh, go to Ephesians 5. I just want to touch on this really quick here. John the Baptist said, It's my job or my ministry to make the voice, or to hear the voice of the bridegroom and to make him known. And Jesus, or the Yahweh of the Old Testament, we see over and over that he is the bridegroom of Israel. Then we see in the New Testament, Jesus shows up on the scene and says, I'm the bridegroom, the, the, the bridegroom, the groom of Israel that's married to Israel. He shows up on the scene and goes, that's me. That's one of the actually, a lot of people don't think about this, that's actually one of the most profound uh, claims of the deity of Jesus in all the New Testament. Because any Old Testament Jewish person would understand that, G, that the, the bridegroom of Israel is Yahweh. And Jesus in bodily form shows up in Jerusalem and in Israel and says, I am the bridegroom of the Old Testament, right? That is like heretical if he was wrong, right? But he's not. It's true. So check this out. In Ephesians 5, go uh, to verse, I encourage you to go back later on and start in verse 22, but for time's sake, we'll go to uh, verse 29, uh, chapter 5, verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does his church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is out of Genesis, okay? There's nothing in there that says anything about the church or Jesus. This is Genesis. But Paul sees a greater truth. Everybody say a greater truth. Greater is, truth. is it true this is about man and woman? Absolutely. But there's a there's a, mis, a mystical, prophetic types and shadow here, Paul says in verse 32. He says this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. I want to say it this way. We think of marriage being kind of like what it is between us and God. It's the other way around. The reality, Paul says, of the mystery is our relationship with Jesus. Marriage is a prophetic symbol of what you have with God, not the other way around. Does that make sense? The reality, the substance, is that we are married to God and we are to be connected to the emotions of the bridegroom. Our marriages in the natural is just to reflect what's already going on in heaven between us and Jesus. Or it's supposed yeah. to be, right? Does that make sense to you? This mystery is profound, he says. I'm saying, when he says I'm referring to verse of Christ, saying, the foundational truth of what's being said here is not about just man and woman. It is, and that's important. He says it refers to Christ in the church. Christ in the church. He says, uh, however, let each one of you love his own wife and let, uh, le let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's go to Song of Solomon. I believe that all good pictures of marriage in all of the Bible, you can find principles, concepts, uh, prophetic ideas, uh, analogies in our relationship with Jesus. Even like Proverbs 31. Everybody knows, every woman knows Proverbs 31. Why? You know, all the single men in the house just said, Lord, send me a Proverbs 31 uh, person. I won't look at working around the room, people think I'm looking at them. Um, but, you know, even a passage like that is a beautiful description of what the bride of Jesus Christ is supposed to be like. Amen. Yeah. There's parts in that passage that, yeah, it's about a woman being ready for marriage, but it's also about the bride of Christ being equally yoked to her husband. Remember what it says in 1 Corinthians. It says, do not be unequally yoked, right? Jesus has the same idea, the same concept for himself. Jesus is not coming back for a, a whore bride, an unbelieving bride. Yeah. He's coming back for a bride that looks and acts 
just like him. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus will be equally yoked before he comes back. I don't yeah. know what you're so over and over, we see this concept in the Old Testament, and it's fulfilled in the New. So we're going to start off in the book of Song of Solomon. I'll just say this, because I, I had a professor at Liberty who said, oh, any Bible person that believes that the Song of Solomon is about Jesus and the bride is a, is a fool. And I, I just would simply say this. I always believe that every single word, every single sentence in the Bible is about Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. Yeah. John Wesley said, if you can't find Jesus in every sentence in the Bible, you're not looking hard enough, right? He's in there. His name ain't mentioned in there. Believe me, there's a principle, there's a concept, there's something in every chapter of the Bible. Or maybe one of the genealogy ones, but there's probably something in there too about Jesus, right? And it's all about him. And so I believe the Song of Solomon is in that too. So, Song of Solomon. The Song of All Songs, verse 1. Which is Solomon's. I want to start right there. If you think the Bible calls this the greatest song of all time, do you think it's going to really be just about Solomon and his wife? Do you think the greatest song ever written was about a king and some woman? Absolutely. The greatest song of all time is going to be about Jesus and the bride, I yeah, sure yes. believe, right? So right there, I believe this is very clear. This is, it is a, a prophetic, spiritual mystery about Jesus and his church. All right, let's start off here. Verse 2. Um, at first, if you're like macho man, it's like, oh, this is so weird. But ladies, you're sons of God. Men, we're the bride of Christ. So let's all just get used to these, uh, these dichotomies, okay? So, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is poured out. Therefore, the virgins love you. Draw me away. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chamber. This is the only verse we're going to cover tonight, but we're going to go into a lot of Bibles. So if you're taking notes, get ready. You first read a verse like this, and it's like, kiss me. You know, oh, you know, like, right? Because we have this weird thing with God where we think he's distant and, and we're separate from him. But... Think about the genesis of humanity, the creation of humanity. You were created, you know, humanity was created, Adam was created with a kiss from day one. The Bible says in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, that God, Genesis 2, 7, God breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life. From man's very creation, we were meant to be face to face in intimacy with God. Man was created in close proximity and intimacy with God. That's what you were made for. Amen. Without daily reality, daily experience of intimacy with God, you're not really living. You're a dead man walking. We're called to live this way, right? He says, let me kiss me with the kisses of, your, of, of his mouth. I like to think of this as the word of God. Jesus in John 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. When we see this kind of language uh, passage, this kind of language in the, in the book of Song of Solomon, we look for other places in the New Testament to get our theology, to get our understanding. And so I read this kind of passage a lot of times. I'll say, Lord, kiss me with your word. Let your word come alive. It's not talking about some weird, you know, uh, romantic, like strange type thing. Uh, it's talking about the Word of God touching the heart of humans, right? There's times that you can just read the Bible and go, oh, that's good theology I just read there. But there's other times where it kisses your heart and transforms you in the place of prayer, amen? I want to tell you, when I have times where I, you know, I, you guys know I like theology. I like reading, you know, boring, uh, you know, Presbyterian and Baptist and seminary type stuff and whatever. I love that stuff. I really do. I enjoy it. Me, Ben, and Ian, we enjoy that kind of stuff. Uh... But sometimes, you can't live on that. You can't live with a steady diet of that, or you will dry up, man. Uh, when I feel like my heart's growing, uh, you know, too busy with working here, or with too much theology, or just being too serious, man, the first thing I do, I break out the book of Song of Song. I sit my Bible on my floor. I've been doing it this week. I sit my Bible on the floor, and I say, Lord, kiss my heart with your word. And all oh, the depths of God that I start to experience sometimes when I just say that little simple, out of my comfort zone phrase of God, kiss my heart with your love. I want to experience you 
it, it's worth a billion dollars to experience that intimacy with God in those moments. This is what we're after. For your love is better than what? Actually, let's go back to, uh, we're going to go to a lot of Bible places. Let's go to James 4 first before we move on here. And it kiss me with a kiss of the mouth. Um, let's go to James 4. Let's start off in James 4 here. James 4 is one of my favorite passages. I up James 4 quite a lot. James 4, verse 5. Uh, let's actually go up to verse 4 just for context. You adulterous people. Wow, that is a good super sensitive <laughs> verse. You adulterous people. It's assuming, you know, you can't commit adultery on somebody you're not married to. Come on. Wow. You're married to God, and friendship with the world, he says, is adultery to the person you're married to. I, I want to say this really quick. If you think about this in the Old Testament setting, God never uh, chastises or uh, condemns the nation specifically for, they, he does for their other sins, but never for spiritual adultery. Israel's called, some pretty harsh words, you're not even supposed to say in church, but they're in the Bible, but uh, at times, why? Because they were married to God and they were committing spiritual adultery. This is the same concept that we see here, that we are married to God, and when we go after, in Israel, is going after the idols of other nations, the gods of the nations. But in the life of the believer, when we have other lovers, it's like committing spiritual adultery, James is saying. Um, he says, uh, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world, anyone who makes uh, friendship with the world makes himself an enemy of God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that of no purpose the scripture says, he who yearns jealously, everybody say jealously. Jealously. Jealously over the spirit he is made to dwell in us. Mm. This is a picture of a passage speaking of Genesis 2-7 when God breathes his breath, his depths of his, of his soul, I believe into the heart of man it says here that he's still yearning jealously for that spirit that lives inside of you again, imagine if we could connect to that jealous heart of God Adam was birthed born, created in a kiss from Yahweh with, we see here in James 4, uh, overflowing from a heart that's burning with love. What if we connect it to that 24-7, 365? That is transformative for cities and nations right there. If we can just connect with God on that level of that...